wanted to really quickly just give another example of where exponential functions show up. We're all familiar with the bell curve. Well, at least I assume we all are. That thing, right? The equation that defines that, the function, is this. It's ugly. It looks horrible. But this is the equation. This is the function that defines the bell curve. So just as an example of where these things show up, anytime you start talking about the statistics of something occurring, you're talking about, in part, this thing. And because of that, knowing things about exponential functions is important. For example, if we wanted to show that the inflection point of this general bell curve was at plus and minus one, how would we go about that? We take the second derivative, set it equal to zero, and check everything, right? We would use our derivative test. And that's all it is. That's all this problem's going to ask us to do is to say, all right, take the second derivative of this and apply your second derivative test to confirm that negative one and one are in fact inflection points. So taking the second derivative, setting it equal to zero, we find we get plus or minus one. For folks at home, we are looking on slide 17 of week nine notes. You can find that under exam three on Blackboard in the course material. So the reason why this plus or minus one shows up, because when we take the first derivative, this is what we get, right? Now, when we take the second derivative, we get this huge mess, but we can simplify it. And when we simplify it, we find this expression, right? Well, this thing on the left, it'll never be zero. Never, ever. This, the polynomial, that factor will be. The x squared minus one injects those zeros into the second derivative. And this will only be zero when x is equal to one, because one squared is one, minus one is zero. Or when x is equal to negative one. Negative one squared is one, minus one is zero. So just as an example of more of why we care about the exponential function and taking derivatives of it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We've got the bell curve. For whatever it's worth, actually, my uh, my little sister recently was trying to find out information about standard deviations and all. She works for the Navy. And they had her doing something with statistics. Mom told me about it after the fact, but Part of what you would need to know, I assume, is some of this stuff. So having said that, I want to ask a question. What if we wanted to do, undo the exponential? What if we're given that y is equal to b raised to the x? We know y and b what's x this question is what antagonized the development of what's called a logarithm 
Unfortunately, there's no nice, clean, closed form solution for logarithms. So the best definitions we have is comparing them to exponentials. Having said that, if x is equal to b raised to the y, then this tells us that the log base b of x is equal to y. So what this does is it solves for your exponent, given that you know what x and b are. Notice between what I just wrote a minute ago and what I wrote now, I swapped the x and the y here. That's just so that down here it's a little bit easier to read. We can think of this as a function of x, right? So x would be our variable, y would be our output. So the only reason I swapped those variables was just to make this a little bit easier to read. But if that's the case, then this thing is the inverse function. That is to say, the logarithm and the exponential are inverses of each other. Now, just a little bit of taxonomy, some notation here. If our base is 10, then we just drop it off and just write log. If our base is e, then we write the ln of x. That said, we use the ln of x so much in math, we've given it a special name. It is the natural log of x. So if I ever say the natural log of x, I'm talking about the ln of x. Moreover, comparing this definition up here to the natural log, well, this definition assumes what B is, right? This definition with the natural log. Here we're saying B has to be equal to E. So we can rewrite this definition in terms of the natural log. We get that the ln of x is equal to b if and only if e raised to the b is equal to x. And again, just some more on the way we talk about these things. Notice that after the natural log, it's just because that would take forever to say, like to get through an entire lecture. If I kept having to say the natural log of, the natural log of, blah, blah, blah. As a result, mathematicians are lazy and we say the ln. So just some little details here, right? Having said that, a little bit more information about just comparing the logarithm to the exponential the ln of one is going to be equal to zero. Why is that? Well, that's because e raised to the zero power is one. And the logarithm is solving for the exponent, assuming you know your base and whatever you're getting out of your exponential, right? The ln of e is going to be 1. That's because e raised to the first power is e. Anytime you put a number through the log of anything, log base, whatever, if the number you're putting through, I shouldn't say log base, whatever, in the case of ln. Let me say it like this.
So the ln of any number is going to be less than zero if and only if that number is between zero and one. And this kind of makes sense, right? If we think about what's happening here, x here is what comes out whenever we raise e to the yth power. So if we want x to be between 0 and 1, then y is going to have to be negative, right? Because e to the 0 is 1, and every power less than that is going to be a decimal number, right? Does this make sense to everybody at home? Folks at home, is this clear? I'm taking a point off for every minute that question goes unanswered. Yeah, it's yeah, it's clear. Awesome, awesome. cool. All right, so having said that, we now know that the ln is the inverse function of e to the x. And just like any inverse function, its graph is the reflection of the original function across the line x equal to y. So what I'm saying, On math fact here. Fun fact about graphs and functions. If you were to compare the graph of a function to its inverse function, they're going to be the reflection of each other across the line x equal to y. So given that we know what the exponential function looks like, right? It's that ever-growing function, e raised to the x grows exponentially. When we reflect it across the line x equal to y, we get that its inverse function looks like this. Now, another point that I want to make, notice that the domain of the ln of x is zero to infinity, not inclusive, right? We're not including zero and we're not including infinity. And this makes some, some just general logical sense, right? Think about e to the x. What x values can we put in to get zero? Nothing, right? What x values can we put in to get infinity? Nothing, right? We can take the limit, but as far as what's in the domain, there's nothing that we can put through e to the x to get out zero or infinity. So because the range of e to the x is equal to the domain of ln of x, because they're inverse functions of each other, we get that the domain of ln, to the ln of x is zero to infinity. Similarly, its range is negative infinity to infinity. We have an intercept at one zero. It's always increasing. And just a couple other details about it that y'all can check out 
on the uh, on the slides after a while. So having said that, let's try to sketch the graph of the ln of x plus one. Before we do, let's think about what that's answering. So we've got our function f of x is equal to the ln of x plus 1. This thing's equal to y, right? Well, what this tells us is that its inverse function, f inverse, of x is going to be equal to e to the y is equal to x plus 1. Agreed? So we can subtract 1 from both sides. Now we can replace x and y with each other. And this is going to be the graph of its inverse function. Okay, this is the graph of its inverse function. tight on space, but I think we can make it work. This thing's going to be increasing forever, right? It's just the exponential function minus one. So it's going to look like this. Well, the graph of our function is going to be the reflection of this across the line x equal to y. So the graph of our function going to look a little bit like this. Make sense to everyone? Yes. So this is one way we can go about finding these inverse functions. Or I mean the graph of these inverse functions. The other way is a tabular approach. Where we just plug in values. We say, all right, let's get a bunch of points and plot them. We know the general form of what ln is going to look like. So knowing that, once we get a handful of points, we can do some guesswork and figure out what the graph of our function looks like. Notice this is the graph of the ln of x plus 1. Pretty much exactly what we just drew on the board. Having said that, like I said, they're inverse functions of each other. And inverse functions just cancel each other out. As a property of inverse functions, we know f of the inverse of x is going to be x. And f inverse of f of x is going to be x. They just undo each other, right? Well, a minute ago, I said that if f of x is equal to e to the x, this thing comes out to be equal to y, then f inverse of x, let me erase that actually, 
is going to come out to be the ln of x, right? So we know that ln of e to the x is going to be equal to x, and e to the ln of x is also going to be x. And this makes sense based on the way we defined the ln or logs, right? We said that the ln of x is going to solve for whatever our exponent is to get out x, right? So we're undoing it. So undoing it, whatever e to the x evaluates out to be, the ln of that thing is going to tell you what the exponent has to be in order for e to compute to that, right? So we're just going to get x. Similarly in reverse. So having said that, some inverse properties of logarithms. Same exact thing as what I've got written on the board. So with this in mind, looking at these two examples, we've got the ln of e raised to the one half or to the uh, square root of two. Well, the ln is going to undo this exponential, right? It's just going to tell you what the power is. So having said that, let me get the square root of two. E to the ln of three X. Well, the ln of three X tells you what you have to raise E to, to get three X. So when you raise E to the ln of three X, you're just going to get three X back. Comparing the exact same things, right? Now, just some general properties about logarithms. The ln of a product is equal to the ln of one factor plus the ln of the other factor. The ln of x raised to a power is n times the ln of x. And because of these two rules, we get the second rule that the ln of x divided by y is going to be equal to the ln of x minus the ln of y. Now, just to prove that these two things lead to this to write it out on the board. So we've got the ln of x divided by y. Well, this thing is equal to the ln of x times y to the negative first power. Using this product rule, we get that this comes out to be the ln of x plus the ln of y raised to the negative first power. But because of this power rule, we're now going to get that we can bring this negative one out. And this thing comes out to be the ln of x plus negative one times the ln of y or just simply the ln of x minus the ln of y. So 
So really, we only need to remember the first and last rule here. Having said that, I'd like for you all to check out A and B, and I'll do C and D on the board. Oh, before I forget, there is a question of the week. So question of the week, everybody, don't forget, there is one. All right, so for A, who got the ln of 10 minus the ln of 9? Folks at home? Anybody? Well, this is in fact going to evaluate out to be the ln of 10 minus the ln of 9. B is going to be one half the ln of x squared plus 1. You're not going to be able to simplify it any further than that. And then we've got C and D up here on the board. But just to compare answers, A comes out to be the ln of 10 minus the ln of 9. B does in fact come out to be one half the ln of x squared plus one. Comparing C with what I got on the board, same thing, right? And D, also the same thing. So checking out another problem, let's move in the other direction. We're given the ln of x plus two times the ln of y. That should come out to be the ln of x times y squared, right? This thing's going to come out to be the ln 
of x plus the ln of y squared using the power rule in reverse. Now using the product rule in reverse, we're going to get the ln of x times y squared. this and just write it off to the side for a second. That was A. Now B, B is 2ln of x plus 2 minus 3 ln x. So the first thing we're going to do is apply the product rule in reverse. When we do that, we get the ln of the quantity x plus 2 squared minus the ln of x cubed using that division property, but in reverse, we're going to get that this whole thing comes out to be the ln of the quantity x plus 2 squared divided by x cubed. Now notice if we wanted to, we could go ahead and use long division and simplify what's inside the ln here just a little bit. I wouldn't suggest doing it, but if we wanted to, we could. I take that back, no, we can't. So, Comparing these answers, the ln of x plus y, or of x times y squared is what a came out to be. And the ln of the quantity x plus 2 squared divided by x cubed. So this is all well and good, but how the hell are we going to use it? Let's say we're given something like A here, or B. Let's go with B, actually, because it's a little bit more involved. It's more involved, and I have a personal philosophy that we should lean into the hard things. <laughs> All right, so B is equal to 10 plus E raised to the 10 or to the T over 10. Notice I just went ahead and replaced this decimal with the fraction. No big deal here. This thing is equal to 14. What is t? Well, the first thing we're going to want to do is subtract 10 from both sides. Now, we want to undo this exponential. So why don't we apply the ln to both sides?
doing that, you're going to get the ln of e to the t over 10. Well, this thing is going to evaluate out to be 10 over 10, or t over 10, right? So let's go ahead and write that. Now we have to take the ln of the other side, right? Because what we do to one side, we have to do to the other side. We're trying to balance these. So that means t over 10 is equal to the ln of 4. Okay. Now all we need to do is solve for t, right? So multiply both sides by 10. That's going to tell us that t is equal to 10 times the ln of 4. So let's compare. Looking at what they've done, they went ahead and subtracted 10 from both sides, took the ln of both sides. They simplified the exponential under the natural log. That's how they got to here. And then they multiplied both sides by 10 to get rid of the decimal. The only difference between what they did and what I did was I went ahead and rewrote the decimal as a fraction. The only difference here. And they chose to write these two steps separately. Is there an advantage of writing a fraction versus having a decimal layer? Um, yes and no. It, it really just depends on what you're given, right? Like, as someone studying math, I like fractions over decimals all day, every day, right? Um, if I can write something precisely, I would prefer to do that. And a fraction is a more precise representation of a rational decimal. Um, so there's that. But there's also just the fact that writing something as a fraction when you can, when it comes to time to simplify things, it usually makes the process a little bit easier. Like getting to here and seeing, okay, I just have to multiply both sides by 10, right? If you got to this point and you didn't think to multiply by 10 right away, okay, that's a little bit more difficult, right? So let's say, for example, I'm going to change this just a little bit. Let's say, for example, instead of 1, we have 0 0.111 repeating. So we're going to go through everything. Subtract 10 for both sides. For those who don't know, anytime you see a bar over a grouping of decimals, that just means those group it, that grouping repeats from that point on. So here all we have is just once repeating forever. Okay. So we're going to apply the ln now to both sides. We multiply both sides by now. Nine. Okay. 
And this is why. This is why I and people who study math prefer to use fractions. Because if you don't recognize right away that this is one over nine, by the time you get to this point, you're doing the wait, wait, what is what is this thing the reciprocal of? Makes sense what I mean? Yeah. For the record, one way to have found this. Whenever you get things like this, one way to have found the solution would have been to say, all right, I know that 0 0.111 is like 1 over 3 times 0 0.333 repeating, which is equal to 1 over 3 times 1 over 3, which is 1 over 9. So, if you don't know to use a trick like this or you don't recognize the decimal right away, that's when usually I would say, try to find that fraction. All right, now what about in the other direction? Oh, just to clarify, for folks at home, if you didn't hear what the question was, that, that last question, that last question was, was there a benefit to using a fraction over leaving it as a decimal? Um, and that's what I was explaining. Why sometimes it's best to just go ahead and jump to the fraction when you can. Um, but having said that, let's check out this next example. This next example, we're going in the opposite direction, right? So let's consider again B. In B, we're told that three plus two times the ln of x is equal to seven. We want to solve for x. Well, this is going to tell us subtracting three from both sides that two the ln of x is equal to 4. Now from here, we may be tempted to do one of two different things. And I'm going to show them both side by side. We may be tempted to say that ln of x squared is equal to 4. And we may be tempted to say that ln of x is equal to 2. Right? Here, all I did was divide by 2 from both sides. And here, I use the product rule. I use that backwards product rule, right? Well, if this is the case, And let's take both sides and raise E to them. This thing, e raised to the ln of whatever, it's just going to be that whatever, right? So this is going to give us x squared is equal to e to the fourth. And down here, this is going to give us x is equal to e to the second. Here we've got a little bit more work ahead of us, right? So really quickly comparing what we just did up here to what they've done. 
we went ahead and divided out the two. Whenever you see a problem like this, just go ahead and divide out whatever that coefficient is on the ln, right? The second you get to this step, you can go ahead and divide it out. Do it. It makes it easier for you. Notice once we actually solve for this, we're going to get plus or minus, right? The question then becomes, can X ever be negative here? And the answer is no, right? We can't take the ln of a negative number because there's no power, no exponential that will evaluate out to a negative number when it's raised to that, right? Does that make sense what I mean? So we actually had two more steps if we went this route. So go ahead and divide out when you can. All right, so now we've got what, 37 more minutes left? Let's go ahead and look at a couple more of these. We're given that we deposit P dollars into an account with an annual interest rate of R that's compounding continuously. How long will it take for our account to uh, double, or our balance to double? Let's recall what this is going to look like. The amount, our balance, is going to be equal to whatever we initially put in, T, times R raised to the T, right? This is the compounding interest formula. Agreed? My mistake, I meant to write E part of the T. I'm thinking of another problem ahead. So from here, we wanna know when this thing's going to be equal to 2P, right? So let's go ahead and replace A with 2P. Divide P from both the sides. Take the LN of both the sides. Divide both sides by R. Which is exactly what we've got up here on the board. Now, how did I know to use 2P? Well, we're trying to double the amount that we put in. So that means we want our balance to be equal to two times the initial amount that we put in. So A has to be equal to 2P. And that's how we were able to set up this problem. Having said that, welcome to section 4.5. Section 4.5 is all about the derivative of logarithms. Let me erase this a little bit. For folks at home, this is slide 44. So, the way to prove what the derivative of a logarithm is. So what we're trying to find is f of x is equal to the ln of x times 
what's the derivative of f of x? And the way we go about this, so we start by saying, all right, well, we know y is equal to the ln of x. If y is equal to the ln of x, then why don't we go ahead and say e raised to the y is equal to x. We can say that. We know that, right? All we're doing here is saying f of x is equal to the ln of x. Well, this tells us that y is equal to the ln of x, right? So now, e raised to the ln of x is equal to e raised to the y This thing is going to come out to be x is equal to e to the y. Now let's differentiate both sides. We want to apply the derivative to both sides. Yeah? Since they're both equal, their derivatives will also be equal, right? Well, we're going to have to apply implicit differentiation to this side, aren't we? We're going to have to just get one here, agreed? So when we do that, we're going to get 1 is equal to e to the y times the implicit derivative dy dx. Let's solve for dy dx. Solving for dy dx. we get one over e to the y is equal to dy dx. But hey, a minute ago, we said e to the y was equal to x. So that must mean then So that must mean then we're going to get that 1 over x is equal to dy dx. dy dx is, of course, the derivative of the ln of x. So using implicit differentiation, we just found that the derivative of the natural log of x is equal to 1 over x. In other words, implicit differentiation wasn't just a tool for me to shut down your throats. It actually turned out to be damn convenient here, because how else are you going to solve this? There's a couple of geometric tricks you could have used, but they would have sucked. So looking then at the derivative of the natural logarithm function, we found that the derivative of the ln of x is equal to 1 over x. But more generally, let's say our function looks something more like this. G 
of x is equal to the ln of u of x. Then the derivative is going to be equal to one over u of x times the derivative of u. All right, using this now. Let's find the derivative the ln of 2x. Here we're saying that u of x is equal to 2x, right? Agreed? So, d dx, the ln of u of x, is equal to 1 over ux times the derivative of u with respect to x. This is going to tell us that this whole thing must be 1 over 2x times two, or in this case, just one over x. Comparing answers, it is the exact same thing. So, looking at a couple more problems, I'd like y'all to try A. I'm going to do B and C up here on the board.
So for A, who got 4x over 2x squared plus 4? Anybody? Well, let's see how it would work. Setting u equal to 2x squared plus 4, the derivative of that thing is going to be 4x. And using the chain rule, we know we're going to get 4x over 2x squared plus 4 which we can reduce by a factor of two. Or simplify, I should say, by a factor of two. Comparing now what I have for B, we have the derivative of X times the ln of X. We're gonna to need to apply the product rule. So we're gonna get the ln of X times the derivative of X plus x times the derivative of the ln of x. See that be the second line here. Simplifying, we're gonna get one plus the ln of x. Similarly, for c, we need to apply the quotient rule. We're going to find that we can simplify, and after we do, we're going to get 1 minus the ln of x over x squared. All right, so what about something more complicated? Something like the ln of the square root of x plus 1. Well, we can rewrite the square root with a rational exponent. When we do, we get the ln of the quantity x plus one raised to the one half power. Well, hey, we have a power rule about uh, uh, logarithms. We can go ahead and bring this out, right? And simplify it to something a lot nicer to one half the ln of x plus one. Now we can apply the derivative. When we do, it comes out to be one over two times the quantity x plus one. So all we did here was before we applied the derivative, we rewrote it using a rational exponent. We applied that product property of logarithms. I mean, uh, the power property of logarithms, and then we applied the derivative. What about here? If you didn't say, oh, hell no, you were wrong. Because that's what I said when I first saw this, right? And I'm not even gonna lie about it. This looks like something that happens after you put gizmo in a pool of water. For those who don't know, that was a gremlin reference. If you don't recognize that reference, you are too young for my class. Get out. Okay. So for this problem, what we're going to have, first we're going to rewrite this whole thing. This is x squared plus 1. That's the quantity squared. First rule we're going to use to rewrite this, the product rule. Now we're going to apply the power rule. This first term is going to stay the same. We're going to get two times the ln of x squared 
plus one. We can't simplify this any further. Now we're going to apply the derivative. This is an X out of Y. Now we can simplify this just a little bit. Come out to be one over X plus four X over X squared plus one. So logarithms generally, when we're differentiating, they're going to look a lot scarier than what they actually turn out to be. When differentiating logarithms, the very first thing you want to do is simplify them. Always, always, always. Simplify them as much as you can here. Just like what we've done here. Because we would rather apply the derivative to this thing than to this beast. That said, we could apply it here if we really wanted to. It would just suck. So looking, comparing, they did the exact same thing, right? They applied the product rule of logarithms first, the, the product property, then the power property of logarithms, and then they differentiated. And I have no clue what happened at the bottom of that number. <laughs> I don't even know what the bottom of that number was supposed to be. I'm assuming a three. It was a two. All right. So in this problem, we start off with the function x squared over two minus the ln of x. When we differentiate both sides, or when we differentiate both terms, that's what I meant to say, we get x minus one over x. Now in this problem, they want us to analyze the graph of this function. So why don't we find some of our critical points? Let's set that thing equal to zero. Add one over x to both sides. Multiply both sides by x, solve, and you get that you have two critical points, one and negative one. And then we can do the rest of our examination process if we want to. Notice here. That negative, the negative one, can't go back to the other side. Um, if we look at what happens when we put negative one into the ln of x, right? Well, the ln of negative one doesn't exist. So automatically, that gets thrown out. 
for you up with just one. Having said that, we only have two minutes left, and I don't think we're going to be able to get through that this problem in a, quite that amount of time. So I'm going to go ahead and let you all go. Um, I'll stick around if you have any questions.